of thanksgiving is my battle cry. With joy as my weapon, I'll stand and defy the lie of the dark with my hands lifted to the sky. And I will rejoice. do that just a little bit. Shout of his goodness. Lord, you are so good. You are worthy of our praise, Father. You are awesome and amazing. And you're right here with us, Father. We thank you so much. We thank you so much, Father. Oh, hallelujah. I'm reminded of 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17 and 18. It says, rejoice always. Pray always without ceasing in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus our Lord I suspect knowing what I know about this church and the people in this church that there's a lot of reasons just in this last week to be concerned about some things be some sad about some things struggling with some things. But I tell you what, I will rejoice. Amen. When we rejoice, the Spirit of God comes in and floods our soul, our spirit, and just brings a supernatural. And, and sometimes it really has to be a supernatural, a supernatural peace in the middle of the storm, a supernatural peace and even joy when our hearts are hurting and when we're struggling with some things. So I will rejoice. We can look at that another way too. I will. It's a matter of our will. It's a decision we make. Have you ever tried to rejoice when you didn't really feel like you had a whole lot of good stuff to rejoice about? That's when it really, really pays off when we decide I will rejoice. Well, get me to preaching so um, by the way congratulations you guys made it on time <laughs> that's I believe in miracles that's awesome <laughs> so turn around shake hands give a hug greet somebody congratulate them for coming here on time Hallelujah. (coughs) 
I was just thinking, two weeks from today starts my 19th year at this church. Wow. Time flies, and I'm still glad to be here. I love this church. Two weeks from here today, though, I won't be here. Um, I'll be over in the Middle East. Um, I guess that's a good, good thing. Today is Mission Sunday, which means the offering goes to missions. So I want to share with you Psalm 67 in reference to missions. God, be gracious to us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us that Your way may be known on the earth your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the people with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. When I think about that, I think that somewhere probably between five and six billion people on the earth today don't know this truth, have not accepted this truth. Missions is really important. Local missions and foreign missions are very, very important. So God bless you as you give this morning. You can go to hopechurchba.com and give. Wave to the people that are watching online. And I'll also give them the baskets back there. So let's just continue to praise God. He is so worthy.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for meeting us where we are. Thank you for not leaving us alone there, but sometimes even dragging us forward into the next area that you want us to grow through. Lord, thank you that you care so much for us and that you demonstrate that every single day. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord. I want us to pray this morning. We have several special needs, lots and lots of needs for prayer. If you need prayer today, how about you lift your hand up? Yeah, lots of us. Everybody here needs the Lord's help. You may not be aware of it, or you may not have admitted it yet, or you may not be conscious of it at this precise moment, but everybody here needs God's help. That song we just sang reminds us, we may not even be thinking about what it's saying, but it reminds us that just the fact we're able to breathe is, is Him. It's Him. So I want us to pray for Libby this morning. She needs prayer. Pray for Sister Linda Owen. She needs prayer. Pray for Brother Daniel Vasquez. He needs prayer. Pray for Brother Dan McKay. He needs prayer today. Pray for Wimara's mom. She needs prayer. Pray for her dad. He needs prayer. Pray for my dad. He needs prayer. Pray for Harry Sneed's dad. Harry's a good friend of mine. He needs prayer. Pray for Sister Connie. Most of you know that Greg passed away this last week. She needs prayer. And lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of other needs need prayer we need to pray we need to pray God answers prayer he does he doesn't always answer the way that I pray but he always answers prayer and God wants you whole he wants you blessed he wants you healthy. He wants you strong. He wants you confident. He wants you bold. He wants you secure. But the key to all of that is He wants you. And while we may not always experience every one of those different descriptors that I just shared that God wants, He wants you. So whatever you're facing, whatever you're challenged by, whatever you're experiencing, whatever obstacle you've got to overcome, whatever challenge you are currently undergoing, God wants you. And He's not left you alone. And He never, ever will. Father, we need you. <laughs> we need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We cry out to you. Lord, you heard all the needs that I mentioned a moment ago. And you see the hands that are lifted. And you know the challenges that are being faced by so many people that you love. And you see all the things that are going on in our country. All the things that are faced around the world. All the struggle, all the pain, all the heartache, all the death, all the destruction, all the despair. God, thank you. Thank you that you're aware. And not only are you aware, it's your desire to give us peace. To give us peace in the midst of the storm. It's your desire, Lord, for us to know that we're not walking through the challenge unaided, but we're walking through the challenge with your strength and with your grace and many times Lord only because you're carrying us through Lord help us to be mindful of you and your goodness and your love 
Help us to focus upon Jesus and, and not focus upon our own selves and our own struggle. Help us to be aware of all the other challenges that are existing around us. And help us to have hearts of compassion as we see others in need. Lord, there are so many needs represented among us and there are so many people that I believe qualify for intervention. They meet the biblical standard. They deserve a response from you. But at the same time, Lord, that's just a thought that we have. The reality is we don't deserve anything because even our very best is as filthy rags. The only reason that we have any access to you is because of your precious blood the precious blood that flows from your veins lord the precious fountain of blood that washes us and cleanses us <laughs> cleanses us the precious blood that we plead over these needs lord god thank you for sending your son jesus to die for our sins Lord, we need you. We need you more than ever before. Help us to focus upon Jesus and not on our own selves and not on our own struggles and not on our own pain and not on our own preferences and our own desires and our own wishes, but upon Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, mercifully loving us, Loving us in spite of ourselves, in spite of our failures, in spite of our own sins sometimes, Lord, you still love us. Even when our faith fails, you remain faithful. Thank you for blessing your people now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. It's good to see you. Happy Spring Forward Day. Right? Is that what they call this day? I'm ready for springtime. Aren't you? Spring has sprung. It is upon us. Well, there's lots of stuff to talk about. And I could share a lot of different things. But I will save you the boredom. And we will get into the Word instead. I could talk about where I've been and where I'm going and what I'm doing and all the stuff we've done the last few days. But I will let you have that another day. I want us to get into the scripture today. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. How many of you are enjoying your handouts, by the way? Some of you like uh, to take notes? Very good. Well, I'll keep doing those, I guess, at least for a little while until I stop doing it. <laughs> No, I, I, I've done that because I feel like it helps with some of our attention deficits. We are in a distracted world, and uh, it helps us to even pay attention a little bit more. And I feel like the gravity of this subject is so intense that we need the help of the Lord and uh, any assistance that He can provide to us in the way of a natural aid, is useful. Luke 21, verse 34. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Say all. That means Christians and non-Christians. 
Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. I'm going to read this again. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't want to know carousing. I ain't drunk. Well, I follow some of you on Facebook, and I know that you got the anxiety of life. Because you sure ain't sharing scriptures all day, talking about Jesus, glorifying God, the anxieties of life, the stock market, and all the other mess going on in our world seems to be something that has distracted a lot of Christians. And he says, that day will close on you like a trap, and it happens suddenly. Some of you have never read this scripture before, have you? For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Everybody, all 7 billion, almost 8 billion people. And he says, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Now I want to point out the word escape here. He's not talking about getting out of here. So many Christians spend all of their focus and emphasis on this idea of God getting us out of here. Always trying to escape. He's not talking about getting us out. He's talking about us being able to endure these kinds of things without being overtaken. Off and on over the past several years, Pastor Joel has taught on end times events on Wednesday nights. I preached on the book of Revelation. Joel shared about modern culture and prophecies in the last several months and their prophetic application. You've watched video series. You've studied books together. And even though I've taught it and seen it, and even though Pastor Joel has taught it and seen it many times, it still hits me in the heart every time I see it. Without a doubt, we are living in the last days. And without a doubt, Peter, James, John, Paul, all of them were living in the last days. And there are lots and lots of things that have already come to pass that can confirm that we are in the last days. And I believe it won't be long before every one of us are asked to stand before Jesus on Judgment Day. So today, I want to take you on a little bit of a path here as we get started and bring you up to date on a couple of prophecies that came to pass over 20 years ago. But over 20 years ago, they were a huge deal. People were selling books, VHS, DVDs. There was lots of excitement in January of 2005 when a new Sanhedrin council was established and set in motion for the first time in 1,600 years. And most of those rabbis, those 71 high-ranking Jewish rabbis, are dead. But Christians got all worked up over it. And this council is important because it establishes the authority in Jerusalem to enact sacrificial observances. Their first order of business in February of 2005 was to approve the blueprints for the rebuilding of the third Jewish temple. And then they began the process of prefabricating this temple and establishing a pathway forward to reinstate sacrifices. I bring all this to your attention today because on May 21st, almost 21 years ago, the Temple Mount Faithful transported the cornerstones for the third Jewish temple through the streets of downtown Jerusalem. 
to let the whole world know that the temple would soon be assembled on the Temple Mount. You say, why are you telling us all this? Because 20 years ago, when all this stuff was going on, everybody was thinking about escaping. We are not called to escape this world. We are called to reach this world for Jesus. Whenever Jesus does return, He is looking for people who are busy doing what He told us to do. He is coming soon. Sooner than you think. But if you don't see Him come, and you leave before He gets here, what difference does it make? Get busy doing what he said. Luke 21 verse 28 says, When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. So there's nothing wrong with being excited whenever we see prophetic events occurring. There's nothing wrong with rejoicing and expecting and being anticipative. Is that a word? Anticipatory. Looking forward to? Nothing wrong with those things. That, that, that's to be expected, and it should be the expectation of the heart of a believer who loves Jesus to look for his return. But what is the motivation that we're looking for his return? You see, I have often preached, and I still stand firm in believing today that end times prophetic stuff is one of the most major distractions that the enemy uses to keep the church from doing its job. The last thing Jesus said before he left this earth was not stand around and wait to escape. It was go. Get busy. Do what I told you to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teach them. Admonish them. Disciple them. Train them up. He didn't say, get busy writing books about every newspaper headline that comes out and trying to connect it back to Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. He didn't say, promote yourself as a student of the Bible who spent the Word of God, spent 80,000 hours studying the Scripture, and you know this and you know that, and sell all your books and tapes. He didn't say that. He said, preach the gospel Go into all the world and preach the gospel. After writing the book of Daniel, Daniel prayed to God for understanding of the things that he had written. Daniel chapter 12, verse 9. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. What does that mean? So Daniel has a revelation from God. He writes it down. And then he's praying, God, I don't have a clue what you're talking about here. Help me understand. And God said, it's not for you to understand. They are for the people of the end time to understand. Now, the challenge is, do we really understand what we think we understand? Or, can we humbly acknowledge that a hundred years ago people thought they understood stuff and we can't find it in their books because all their books were wrong too? Can we humbly acknowledge that the priority is not about us figuring every detail out on the timeline to be able to say it's going to happen this way and this way and this way and these things are going to occur before this occurs and that occurs and this is going to be going to set off a chain reaction of events and it's going to all lead us to this great, great place. Because that's not the priority. The priority is the gospel. 
Now, I will acknowledge, or at least I think I will, that never before in the history of the church have we had the level of understanding of biblical prophecies that are happening or that have happened. I think many of them have occurred, and we can see very clearly in Scripture where certain things have occurred. And God is revealing things as time un unveils itself. But much of it is still a mystery. Daniel said, They that understand among the people shall instruct many. So God has given us some understanding, but not so we can sell books. Not so that we can sell tapes. Not so that we can sign up for gimmicks. Not so that we can attend a cruise with this great scholar that they're going to make lots of money on. He's given us understanding so that we can instruct people about the last days and the good news that Jesus saves. The Apostle Paul clearly understood the intention of God in the end times. Romans 13, verse 11, he says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Since we are the people of the end time, and we know the time, then now is the time to wake up, to step up, to step out, and to proclaim Jesus is coming like never before. In our text, Jesus said, listen, you need to watch and pray always so that your day or that the day does not take you unawares. Jesus is talking to all of us. He's saying the church needs to understand the times that we live in. But it's kind of like he's also saying, look guys, it's the two-minute warning. The time has come to give it all. It's like he's saying, we're down three runs, bases are loaded, it's the bottom of the ninth, you got two outs, and the count is full. This is your last shot. The enemy is attacking like never before. Our adversary is seeking whom he may devour. It is time to watch and pray always. You say, well, are you going to preach on prophecy all day? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. We know we're living in the last days. But my intent is to show you today what the Bible says that we, the church, should be doing during the last days. Paul said, wake up out of sleep. Jesus said, watch and pray always. I don't think I did slides for all these verses, but 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says, The end of all things is at hand. Be sober and watch unto prayer. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. There are probably at least 15 more scriptures that I could quote today or use today or read today but the message is the same wake up watch and pray always i spoke a couple weeks ago about how often we should pray and the gist of that message is we must pray always so the added element today to that message is that we need to wake up and watch. The Greek word for watch is nepho, which means to be sober, to be alert, to pay very close attention. We sometimes have this mistaken concept that all of these signs and prophecies are going to be easy to see and to know. 
we think we're going to know who the Antichrist is. You don't believe me? Look, think back a few years. Richard, Milhouse, Ronald. Look. And, and the, the way we approach this stuff is so corny. Yes, amen. We assume it's going to be plastered across the headlines. Twitter, breaking news. Antichrist reveals himself. We think we're going to be able to identify the confirmation of the covenant. We assume we are going to be able to know how the mark of the beast is going to be implemented. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. It's going to be cashless society. It was going to be credit cards in 1982. It's going to be a microchip. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, beware lest these things take you unawares. How many of you knew that the cornerstones of the temple were moved into the city of Jerusalem? One person. If you look it up, you try to Google search for it, you're not going to find a lot about it. In fact, you'll probably find more about Michael Jackson. Y'all remember him? If we want to be able to save our loved ones, our communities, our families from hell, we're going to have to be alert, watching, and praying. When we understand the time, we will instruct many. But if it catches us unawares, we will instruct no one. When Jesus was saying to watch and pray always, he was saying our prayer must be sufficient for the times in which we live. What's that mean? It means the prayer that you prayed yesterday was probably good for yesterday, but it's not the prayer for today. The time that you sacrificed yesterday is probably not sufficient for this very moment. What caused success in the past may not bring success in the future. Can you hear me today? We have to be willing to do whatever is necessary to accomplish the plan of God for this generation. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. I did have a slide on this one. It says, and of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. He said, what in the world does that have anything to do with? To have success in these times, the church has to step up our efforts in prayer and fasting and evangelism because we have to know what God wants us to do. And the only way we're going to know what God wants us to do is to hear from God. Jesus is the greatest example that we have of keeping step with the demands of the day. From his birth into Bethlehem to his death at Calvary, he was in sync with God's purpose. Luke chapter 9, verse 51 says, It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Just prior to his betrayal. What is he talking about here? It says it came to pass when the time was come. That means whenever he prayed, he prayed according to the moment that he was walking through. He wasn't praying a prayer from decades ago. Just prior to his betrayal, he prayed in Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. Luke twenty two thirty nine 39 says, As he came out and went in as his custom was to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. Jesus had been watching under prayer. He, he knew what was about to happen. But he also knew that his prayer had to go beyond what he had prayed before. 
The Bible says in Luke 22, verse 44, it says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, it, was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. What in the world does that mean? He prayed more earnestly. I mean, his prayers had always been deep and sincere and effective, but now he prayed differently. If Jesus had to pray differently, if he had to pray more earnestly, if he had to be more focused and passionate, then all of us should be adjusting our prayers accordingly. Why? Because the times demand it. Because we're God's instrument in this world. Because we are called to be the people of God. At the time of Jesus, the world population was around 270 million people. The majority didn't know Christ. Today, the world population is approaching 8 billion. Guess what? Still, the majority do not know Christ. If Jesus was able to see urgency in the hour of his day, how much more should we be sensitive to the urgency of our day? Our prayers should be more focused, more sincere, more intense, more passionate, and more often than ever before. Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 says, And he comes unto the disciples and finds them asleep and says unto Peter, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Does that sound familiar? What's Jesus saying? He's saying the same thing to us today as he said to them. There is no time for sleep. He said you need to watch. You need to understand what's about to happen. You need to pray. You need to pray like you've never prayed before. I need your prayers right now. Jesus was saying, in essence, I know you want to follow me and that you don't think you really need this, but you really do. Yesterday's commitment was fine for yesterday's demands, but tomorrow's pressures will be more intense. You really don't know what you're about to face. We need to prepare for what is about to happen. If we are not prayed up, we may not be able to handle it. That's what he said in our text when we began this morning. You could be overtaken suddenly. The disciples probably had this attitude of like, haven't we done enough already? I mean, goodness, Lord, we left everything. We've been following you around. Been doing everything you tell us to do at your beck and call, every whim that you have. You want to go over here, we go over there. You want to go over here, we go over there. You want us to feed a bunch of people? Fine. You want us to hang out with Samaritan woman? We don't even talk to Samaritans. We never even go into that place because we are racist. But anyway, they don't look like us, they don't act like us, they don't pray like us, and so we don't want anything to do with them. But you want us to go there, so we go there. I mean, but but you're still pressuring us to do more? course you see that's the thing about god that's the thing about jesus is he never lets up he's always full throttle he's always pedaled to the metal he's always there's more to be done there's no time for stopping no time for quitting no time for relaxing no time for retiring no time for resigning no time for rest He said, well, I know Jesus took a nap in the back of the boat, so he doesn't mind us resting. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the priorities that we should have in our lives. He doesn't care if you take a vacation. He doesn't care if you rest. But what he does care about is what are your priorities? I mean, surely Jesus knew what was best for them. 
Don't you think so? Somehow or another, though, they still couldn't grasp the urgency of the hour. I venture to guess the same is pretty accurate for us today. Probably even more so. Because we aren't hanging out with Jesus the way they were. We aren't walking and talking with Him every day the way that they were. We aren't feeding the 5,000 and observing miracles and seeing dead people raised and seeing people brought back to life and seeing the healings and miraculous outpourings that they were seeing. And they missed out on the urgency of the hour. They couldn't sense it, they couldn't see it, and they slept on it. The signs of the times flew right past them without them even blinking an eye. And you know the story. Because it wasn't very long after that, the scripture tells us that all of the disciples forsook him and fled. What's your point, Pastor? Our commitment must match the demands of the day. Otherwise, we will fall, we will fail at the moment when He needs us most. You say, boy, this isn't super encouraging. This should be one of the most inspiring messages you've heard in a while. You need it, I need it, we all need it. If we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always gotten. If we want greater revival, we have to have greater commitment. If we want to see more miracles, we have to have more prayer. If we want to win more souls, we have to witness to more people. You see, the days of people driving by and reading a church sign and just stopping in aren't filling the pews. We have to be careful we don't ever get that attitude that the disciples had that night in the garden. You say, well, what attitude is that? Well, I come to church twice a week. Pay my tithes, read my Bible, pray, fast every now and then. Sometimes they even help. I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I, I need you to know... I. As your pastor, it's my duty to warn you that tomorrow will not be like yesterday. Most people don't think they need this kind of preaching, but they do. Scripture tells us in the last days, perilous times will come don't hear a lot of preaching about perilous times but yet i see anxiety constantly on facebook and twitter from christians about the perilous times that we're living in but if you preach on perilous times and you don't preach on prosperity and and all of the other feel-good stuff well you're not necessarily the right kind of preacher in our culture today What I'm telling you is that you must adjust your pace according to the race. There's no time for letting down. There's no time for putting it on cruise control. There's no time for holding back. This is an all or nothing, all in moment in our faith walk with Jesus. This is a time to make the priorities of the kingdom of God the priorities of our own life. Jesus said that your spirit will be willing, but your flesh will be weak. He nailed it. And he's talking to the guys that he handpicked, that walked around with him, that were used by him. And what he's saying to them is, I can see that your spirit is willing. Modern day vernacular, he's saying, I see that you raised your hand that you'd be willing to pray. I see that you raised your hand that you'd be willing to help out. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. And we all fight that. 
But here's the thing, we all have to overcome that. If we're going to make it, we must overcome. There's persecution ahead. And I'm not just talking about not saying Merry Christmas. And in the midst of it all, truth is being compromised. The popular culture of our day is compromising truth. There's so much here. So many layers here. 2 Timothy 3.1 In the last days, perilous times shall come. Danger. 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 You ever, you ever stood at a crosswalk in a big city and you, you press that button to get across? Wait. 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 Danger. 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 In the last days, perilous times will come. 2 Timothy 3.12 All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. It does not say shall enjoy ultimate prosperity. And it, verse 13 it says, And evil men and seducers will become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Bible says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. That means your faith is going to be tested. Your prayer life is going to be put on trial. Your walk with God will be attacked by the enemy, by your own flesh, by your friends, and by your family. It's time to wake up. It's time to watch. It's time to pray. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. A modern translation says makes tremendous power available. How many want some tremendous power? Spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. If you want tremendous power, you have to do what the Bible says brings tremendous power. That's pray. Earnest prayers, passionate prayers, focused prayers, intense prayers, dedicated prayers, consistent prayers, always prayers. The heartfelt, continuous prayer of a righteous man or woman makes tremendous power available. If we want these things in our lives, we must do the things the Scripture prescribes. The days of playing games, of skating along, of having a good old time, Well, they never really were supposed to be. But I'm telling you, God is calling us to a level of intensity that many of us have not experienced. Now, here's the good news. He isn't calling us to do anything He's not willing to help us do. He isn't calling us to do anything He's not willing to help us achieve. He isn't challenging any of us to do anything. He's not able to enable us to achieve and accomplish for his sake and for his glory. But friends, I'm telling you, the day is upon us. The time has come. Jesus is calling us to a new level of commitment. Prophecy is fine. It shouldn't scare you. Revelation begins with, Blessed is the person who reads these words and understands them. 
If you're scared, that means you don't understand them. If you're anxious, that means you don't understand them. And understanding doesn't mean that you figure it all out. Understanding means you put your trust and hope in the Lord and lean into Him and follow Him, pursue Him passionately, more passionately than ever before. You recognize the things that are able to be discerned and you leave the other stuff to Him to reveal whenever He decides to reveal it. And you recognize and respect the reality that He doesn't just reveal things to one or two really special people. He's not into secrets. He's not into trying to make somebody popular because he reveals something to them and doesn't reveal it to the rest of us. The purpose, the motivation, should always be the priority of the gospel. Sharing the gospel. Making disciples. Winning people for Christ. Expressing his love in compassionate and sincere and relevant and realistic ways that cause a bridge to be built, a path to be revealed, the steps to be ordered. God wants us to rise up, to be used, to be useful in his hands. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We need to pray. I'm going to invite you to come and pray. We need to change this from a stage to an altar. From a platform to a place of sacrifice. And if you want to pray, come. And find a place. If you want to stand, you want to kneel.